Actually, that's sort of funny. I'm not a biochemist. <laughs> I'm a biologist who happens to have a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Um, but I've uh, always been interested in biochemical mechanisms. Uh, but I'm really more interested in development and in how cells work. And part of that is biochemistry. So there have been lots of people that have influenced me uh, over time. There have been uh, teachers that have inspired me, but not particularly to pick a particular topic. Um, most of my work, uh, my academic work, has been on a small worm and trying to study the nerve cells and how they develop and how they function. And that work really started when I was a postdoc, and it was a suggestion that a high school friend of mine gave me, who was working in the same lab, and I found that sort of a fascinating problem, and then took things from there. So, uh, in the most immediate effect, it was my friend, and uh, who I, we were both postdocs together at the time, and then, uh, his name was Bob Horvitz, he got a Nobel in 2002. And then the person who had started that project was John Salston, who also shared the prize in 2002. And those were very important people. But in a larger sense, there have been other people that have shown me a lot of kindness along the way and helped me uh, just by welcoming me into the scientific community. And that's helped enormously for me. So different people at different times help one, uh, and I think that's one of the very nice things about doing science is that people uh, can be uh, suddenly instant friends basically because you bond over the science. I was awarded the Nobel Prize for my work with green fluorescent protein. And there only was one publication uh, on GFP. I had heard a seminar in 1989 in which this wonderful protein from a jellyfish was described. And because of two things, I was the only person, I think, in the room that got excited. And those two things were, at the time, I was studying nerve cell development. And that meant that we were cloning genes and we wanted to know what cells are active, activating those genes. The animal that we work with is transparent. And as a result, when someone told me there was a protein that all you had to do to see it was to shine light on the specimen and then you would see where the protein was, I realized I could look at where the genes were turned on in my transparent animal, and I got very excited about that. Uh, I then found a person who was working on the system, and we worked together to show that this idea that I had actually worked, that one could put this protein in, now we know which any organism, and be able to see where it works. And so, uh, it was a, a chance seminar that uh, came at exactly the right time when I was thinking about particular problems uh, and particular work that we were doing. And I said, oh, you know, we could use that. So fortunately, the experiments then worked and we were able to show that it did uh, do what it was supposed to do and then people took it from there. So, I often talk about this in my seminars, and I usually preface it by saying that as I get older, I like translational research more, because I'd like things to be applied to my health as well as anybody else. I think there's a great attraction for research that has an immediate outcome. But I think what people often neglect is the idea that one needs to have the basic research as the foundation for the applications. And 
sometimes it has been that people have felt, oh, we've learned enough. We don't need to learn anymore. We have enough of the pieces of the puzzle. Now we can just put it together. And my feeling is that's not true. And every year a new discovery comes up to show us how little we really understand. So my basic take is, well, I really like people to apply the research that we've done and other people have done. And I think that's a very admirable thing to do. On the other hand, I realize that being able to provide the new knowledge is also extremely important. Um, I often like to say that if we think about the laser, no one, when the laser was being developed in the 1950s, came up to the people, Charles Towns and others, and said, you know, this would make a wonderful, wonderful thing, this physics project that you're doing. I'm from the record industry, and we need to have CDs. Or I'm in the movie industry, we need to have DVDs. Or I'm in the medical community, we need to do laser surgery. Those all came after the basic research that was absolutely fundamental in developing all these things. GFP is a good example of this too because we were trying to answer a particular question. We were interested in basic science, but people had used it in so many ways for applications in many respects. Uh, some of them are tied to translational research, other, just like with the laser, are used for more basic research that then in turn is used uh, in different ways. So I think both are needed. But the foundation is basic research. Uh, so I had good science teachers in high school. Um, none of them were particularly inspiring except for one. Uh, in my senior year, I took an advanced chemistry class. Uh, and we had not an exchange student, we had an exchange teacher. This is a teacher that came from England to our school outside Chicago and taught for a year. Uh, his name was Leslie Sturgis, and he was, uh, we just had a lot of fun in the class. So it didn't make me want to be a chemist or a biochemist, it just was a fun class. And so he was probably the most inspiring of the high school teachers that I had. The others were good, but none such that I came away as graduated from high school saying, oh, I just have to be in biology or physics or chemistry. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, inspired in that way. Uh, in fact, I first tried uh, to be a math major and uh, and that was more because I had a very inspirational teacher in my first year of college rather than uh, in high school. And uh, I really liked what he was saying, but eventually I decided I didn't quite have it to be a mathematician. I think that it already is, in a sense. I, the, the, If you talk to almost any kid, he or she is interested in animals, in plants, in the planets, in the stars, in dinosaurs. They automatically have a love of trying to figure out what the world is because when they're very young, they are really trying to figure out this strange place that they live in. And I think they already have an interest in it. Uh, I think maintaining that interest is a very important thing. It's something that needs to have a, a, a little work. And in fact, I almost think it's sometimes the opposite problem. It's not the problem of getting children uh, in the elementary school interested. It's getting the people as they become, these children as they become teenagers, to not say, oh, that's something that the little kids do. I'm going to be interested in something else. So I think it's maintaining that interest in the world around you that's really a very important aspect of education right now. On the other hand, you know, we do send children uh, to 
uh, Suzuki method violin class when they're very young, or we send them to dance class, or we send them to art class, so they have music lessons, and so on. And so we give them this experience of learning and mastering an instrument, for example, and that's wonderful. And some people become lifelong musicians or artists or dancers or, uh, because of this early introduction. I, I'm not so sure we do that as much with science. Uh, I think it could be done. Uh, I, I've sort of been curious as, as to that sort of interface. What would happen? How could you do things that would make people say, I can discover the world. Uh, and there's a lot that I can ask about. Questions that people see all the time, things in front of them that they see all the time and haven't really been taught. You know, you should question that. You should try to ask why that is. I'm not a big fan of these numerical things. I think, I think uh, you know, the, the, the most famous is, is for journals, the impact factor. The impact factor started, my understanding of it, is that it started because it was a, uh, a way that librarians could decide what journals they should have in their libraries. Because if they, if no one was reading the journal, then why should they pay money? If only one person was reading that journal, well, maybe that one person should pay for it, but the school should not, and the library should not do that. And so that was what it was designed for. It was designed to say, how many times do people look at this journal? That has nothing at all to say about the quality of work there in any way. But yet, all of a sudden, it put a number on scientific enterprise. And so one could say, oh, you have this work, and it's in this journal. Therefore, that work must be important. Now, you could have retracted that paper. It could have been completely wrong. It's nothing to do with the quality of the paper. It was trying to judge the paper and judge the person on the basis of how many people looked at the journal. They may not ever look at that paper, so there's no way of knowing. So it's a very misleading thing, but it was a number. And if you have numbers, you can put numbers in a line, and you can say, this person has this number, this person has that number, I'm going to make a judgment about what that means. And so they ignore, actually, reading the science. You know, understanding what the person did, seeing what the importance of the work is, or the inventiveness about the work, having really thought through the, the impact of what someone has done, as opposed to impact meaning, do people look at this journey? The H index is, I feel, is like that too. It's a way that people can get away from actually having to work at doing the evaluation. And evaluations are hard because it's very difficult to compare a person that does one, is working in one area and a person who's working in another. I'll give you an example of, of, of this. And I know of a, a situation at the department where every year they have new graduate students coming in. And every year, uh, the two most popular people, that's impact, right? The two most popular people are in a very wonderful department. One person has a wonderful lab, lots of active people, is always coming up with new ideas, very productive. It's a very exciting place to be. People should want to talk to that person. The other person has almost no one working for them, has not been able to get funding, has had difficulty, and in fact is basically shutting down the lab. Why was that person? About. Well, those two people, as opposed to all the other people, had one thing in their description of their work that all the others did not. Those two people were the only two people who said, I work on cancer. Because the students say, oh, cancer, that's got to be interesting. They became the two most popular people to be interviewed by. 
not because of the nature of their work, but because of this work. So undergraduates go into graduate school, and they only know a couple of words. They know cancer, they know stem cell, they know Alzheimer's. That they know a couple of big words, and so they're attracted. I wonder what this person is doing with that. But that doesn't say anything about the nature of the science. So you can tell I have strong feelings about this way of so-called evaluation. I think that administrators love these things because they don't have to think. They can get a number to compare. But I think that's inappropriate. So I'm not, I'm not so keen on this. And I think I'm not keen on this because uh, I have had experiences in my life that have had nothing to do with my scientific lineage. And I'll give you one example. When I was in my, during my postdoc, I uh, published a paper that had to do with microtubules and how they, how they were arranged in nerve cells. And the paper was sent off, and I was doing other work, and I started to apply for jobs. And I, I was in England, I was applying for jobs in the United States, I was getting no offers at all. The paper came out, and it happened that a friend of mine, another postdoc, was in the United States, and he was being interviewed, and one of the people interviewing him said, oh, I just saw, I was just at a meeting, and we were talking about this paper by this guy, Chelfie, where you are. Do you know him? And is he a staff member? Is he someone there? Because we never heard of this guy. And my friend said, no, he's not a staff member. He's a postdoc like me. And in fact, he's having uh, no, he's getting no invitations to come and talk. And the guy said, that's strange. And immediately picked up the telephone and called two of his colleagues at other universities and said, you know that guy we talked about at the meeting? He's looking for jobs. I can get him invited here. Can you guys invite him to your place? I got three invitations. Not by my lineage or anything, but because they looked at the work. And that, to me, is quite wonderful about science. It's not who you know, it's what you did. Early in the history of molecular biology, when the structure of DNA was just being had just been discovered, 1953-1954, there were several people that were the in group, the people that were closest to Crick and Watson, and, and there was a physicist named George Gam uh, Gamow, and he had this wonderful idea. All these people would be in a group called the RNA type cell. 20 people, each one was named for an amino acid, and they were going to be the ones that would discover all of molecular biology. They were the in group. And they were all good scientists, and they did discover quite a lot of wonderful stuff. But the thing that they really wanted to discover was the genetic part. How was it that protein was made from the sequence in DNA? And they were not the ones that discovered it. It was somebody completely outside, a couple of people completely outside. It wasn't the people with the lineage that were important. It was people with good ideas. And I think that's one of the nice things about science, is that it's not the lineage. It's not uh, who you work for. Uh, it is more that you can get ahead on your ideas. And I think that, to me, well, maybe that's a little naive, but I think that really is the case. But there's many aspects to this problem. It is striking. Uh, that in many countries they feel that there's a brain drain, that they have produced wonderful people through their education systems and then see them go off to another place. And for quite a while it was coming to the United States and then what really struck me is that every one of these, many of these countries have excellent education systems. So it's not that there's a problem educating people to become scientists. 
It's that there were not the opportunities for them to be scientists in their own country. I think one of the things that's been really remarkable about Brazil has been the change of really supporting science that has occurred over the last, where people have realized that this is a, an important thing to stimulate. So uh, I've often wondered about, you know, you know, there's sort of three stages. There's the stage that sort of under, up to undergraduate education, how you make educated individuals. Then there's the training stage. How do you get a world-class graduate program? And then there is what happens after that. How do you get this science class that can do it? And my feeling is that many countries have the first part. They know how to educate people. They produce wonderfully educated people that then go away. And I don't even think it's that a big of a problem for them to go away. I think that's fine. Somebody else will train them to be, you know, PhDs. But it's having them come back. So I think the order should be do the education first, then have something that they can come back to. And then those people will then say, oh, I'm going to train the next set of people that may stay here. So I think I, 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 that's... that's one approach that I've been deploying to get them back up my head. As I say, I'm not a biochemist. I have an undergraduate degree in biochemistry, but it was more a, a way of studying a lot of science in different aspects. But it's clearly understanding, the mo to me, it's the molecules of life. To understand how it is at a molecular level that the processes that we see in cells and organisms are able to take place. So there's all sorts of aspects of how those molecules work together. And biochemistry is really at that junction. It's really at the part where one's asking, what is the consequence to biological functions of the molecules involved in this?